It's good to be with you once again. Today I wanna talk about by faith it is finished. By faith it is finished. We're gonna look at the cross. Next week we're gonna look at the resurrection. Today we're gonna look at the cross and what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross, amen? There's three words that he said that are beautiful. I wanna unpack those today. It is finished. We need to go to John chapter 19 so we can look at this. It's the only place it's said in the gospels is in John 19. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in, starting in verse 16. You know, if, if you've been saved for a while, sometimes you can kind of lose the uh, appreciation for the cross. And it's, it's just natural. You know, sometimes you just have to be reminded. And we, we got to be careful that we don't take for granted what was accomplished for us by Jesus on the cross. So it's great that every once in a while, you know, every, or we, we do communion, we do once a month, or we have Easter that comes around every year, or maybe you're reading the gospels and you're reminded. But today I wanna help encourage you. If, if you are a believer, I pray that your, your gratitude for what Christ did for us on that cross will go deeper. If you are someone who's seeking God, you're an unbeliever, I wanna encourage you to have an open heart to receive today, to learn what Jesus has done for you. And for us as believers, let's be reminded and be grateful, amen? John 19, and we'll start with uh, verse 16. Then Pilate turned Jesus over to them to be crucified. So he was just facing his trial and he's turned over to be crucified. And so they took Jesus away Carrying the cross by himself, he went to the place called Place of the Skull in Hebrew, Golgotha. We also know this as the Hill of Calvary. There they nailed him to the cross. And that's, that's all John says. When it comes to being crucified, that's all John could bear to say is they nailed him to the cross. Think about that. He's been with him for three, maybe three and a half years. You don't want to go into details about your friend and the gruesome death, do you? So he just says they nailed him to the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side with Jesus between them. We know that that was two criminals, right? Have you ever thought about that, that Jesus was crucified between two robbers, two criminals? This perfect person crucified between two sinners, two criminals. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek so that many people could read it. Then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, change it from the King of the Jews to he said, I am the King of the Jews. Pilate replied, no, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let's throw dice for it. This fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. And that was quoted in the book of Psalms hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified. So our prophecy... Verse 25, standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, he said to her, he's actually referring to himself, dear woman, here is your son. And he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. So John was tasked with taking care of Jesus' mother. Verse 28, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished and to fulfill scripture, he said, I am thirsty. How interesting is that, that Jesus called himself the river of life, a, a fountain or a river that would never stop flowing and yet Jesus is thirsty. It's a paradox that Jesus was taking on all of our sin that now he thirsts, but he is the river of life that would give us an ending flow of forgiveness and love. Praise the Lord for that. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. 
Now that's interesting too, because in the Old Testament and the Passover at the end uh, in, the, um, in Egypt, when God had them put the lamb's blood over the doorpost, they had to use a hyssop branch to do that. So now we have scripture connecting Jesus to the greatest Passover lamb. So the hyssop branch was used for him as well. When Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and released his spirit. So he gave up his spirit. He gave himself up first. Death didn't take him, he chose to go. And that's important because he has dominion over death too. It was the day of preparation and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies hanging there next, the next day, which was the Sabbath. A very special Sabbath because it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to hasten their deaths by ordering that their legs be broken. Then their bodies could be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. One of the soldiers, however, pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water flowed out. This report is from an eyewitness giving an accurate account. He speaks the truth so that you also can believe. He's talking about himself. These things happen in fulfillment of the scriptures that say not one of his bones will be broken. So an also an Old Testament prophecy and they will look on the one they pierced. Also stated in the Old Testament before it even happened. It is finished. What does that mean? Well, the Greek word for finished is to telestai. And it means finished. It means complete, fulfilled, or it's accomplished. It was a conqueror's cry, Charles Spurgeon says. It was uttered with a loud voice. There is nothing of anguish about it. There is no wailing in it. It is the cry of one who has completed a tremendous labor. My friends, when Jesus said it is finished, he wasn't saying I'm finished. He said the task is finished. Amen. Amen. The devil would like to think that he was finished. Oh, he was wrong. The task and the work that God gave Jesus was finished. What was that work? Well, he was to seek and save the lost, like Luke 19, 10 says about Zacchaeus and all those who are lost. And Jesus did just that. He came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus was called to build a church. So he, and a lot of people don't see this as an important task. We miss this sometimes, but Jesus called the 12 disciples and trained them and equipped them to carry on the task. And he kept, he was able to keep the one, except for the one that was born for destruction, which is Judas. He kept all of his disciples safe and trained them up and prepared them for the task. Jesus fulfilled over 300 prophecies from the Old Testament. Jesus is the fulfillment of scripture. All the foreshadowings pointing to Jesus, Jesus fulfilled as well. He finished those as well. Jesus obeyed God and glorified God to us. He talked about his kingdom. He talked about God. He told us the way is only through him. Jesus did everything he was supposed to do and now we are beneficiaries of his obedience. Praise the Lord. It, it wasn't a defeat cry, it is finished. It was a victorious cry. It is finished. I did it. And I did it for you, God. And I did it for them. There's also other forms of this word, like teleos or other Greek words. And one of them actually refers to and possibly has been interpreted here of the receipts that would be finished or complete when someone owed a debt or money. If they owed something to someone else or they owed something to the state, so to say, there would be this receipt that says, all right, all done, finished, you've completed it. You have no more debt to pay. Jesus was saying, your sinful debt has been paid in full. My sinful debt has been paid in full. You no longer have an open account where you still owe a lot or whatever it may be, you know, we think of money, but then for, for God, it was perfection. 
a sinless life. We could never do that. Jesus did that for us. And he paid for our debt. Let me give you some scripture to help bring that into light. And I just want you to keep this in mind that you know, your receipt is finished, okay? You, you no longer owe any of this to God because of what Jesus did for you, okay? 2 Corinthians 5, 21. <laughs> Praise the Lord, amen. For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right or justified with God through Christ. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. There's the, the provision for our debt, in other words. What does it is finished mean? There is provision for our sinful debt. And Jesus was that payment. First John, I'm sorry, First Peter 3, 18. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. One time. Okay, his blood is so powerful that he died for all of our sins and the sins of the whole world, according to 1 John 2, 2, one time to cover past, present, and future. That's beautiful. One time. <laughs> Here's the thing. Here's why it was so powerful, because he never sinned. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He provided the way home for you and me on that cross. The provision of your sinful debt has been paid in full because of what he did. Now, if that's not a, a good enough scripture for you, which I think it's beautiful, right? It's good. How about another one? How about Colossians 2, 14? He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. You have a record of debt with God. You have a record of sin. He took it. And it was nailed on the cross with him and it's been canceled. Your sin has been canceled. You are no longer guilty of it. You are free if you believe in Jesus Christ today. Your record of debt has been satisfied. NIV version says, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. You are, my friends, forgiven. Our debt is paid and we are forgiven. What is this scripture trying to say? Our inability to fulfill or to fully obey the requirements of the law left us indebted to God. So we weren't able to follow the law perfectly. We sinned, especially in Old Testament, we're seeing this. That's the story. Okay, Jesus obeyed, though, in the New Testament, Jesus obeyed God's law perfectly, fulfilling its requirements, and then even paid the price for our debt. Jesus wasn't paying his debt because he never sinned. He was paying our debt that needed to be satisfied, and he took care of it, and he paid it in full. So what we couldn't do, Jesus did for us, in other words. What was impossible for you and I, well, he took care of it. Now, he had to live sinless. He had to live sinless. He had to obey God. He had to fulfill scripture. And that's why he's saying it's finished. It's been accomplished. Well, what else did he accomplish on the cross? What else did he finish? He finished the conflict between us and God and made a way for us to have fellowship with him again. So let me give you the second point. We have peace with God because of the cross. We have peace with God because of the cross. Colossians 1, 19 through 22, for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through him God reconciled everything to himself so he restores everything back to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Isn't that a paradox as well? To have peace through someone dying, that doesn't make sense but it had to be the blood of Christ to die for us, to bring us back into a relationship with God and to bring peace in our life. And this is what he says to the church, this includes you who were once far away from God. You used to be like that. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions or sin. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself 
through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. So now you're back in fellowship with God and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. That has, is what is accomplished through the cross when you believe in what Jesus has done for you. When you believe it, that's what you receive is fellowship with God and he looks at you as blameless and without a single fault. That just, I don't even, it's hard to fathom that, isn't it? I'm still working on that. But I believe that what Jesus did, he took care of my sin, my debt, so I can be in relationship with him. And the same thing with you when you believe. Peace with God. There's a biblical word in the Old Testament that's not really mentioned a lot in the New Testament, the word atonement. Or atoned in the New Testament. What does that mean? It's a covering for sin, a covering for an offense. It also means at one mint. At one mint. What does at one mint mean? It, it means to be at one with one another. So in, when two parties were, you know, back in the Old Testament, you had a, a person who may have hurt someone else. There needed to be atonement or maybe someone accidentally killed an animal that belonged to someone. There had to be some kind of atonement offering, some kind of reconciliation between the two parties to fix that. And that way there would be, the, kind of like the play today, there was grace between them and it required a, a death of something or a giving of something to fix that offense. Atonement. To bring peace back into that relationship. Well, the reason why we had sacrifices in the Old Testament was that God wanted to be in fellowship with us. And maybe, maybe we missed this, okay? Hold on, buckle in, okay, you ready? The reason why there was a tabernacle built in the Old Testament isn't because God wanted you just to sacrifice animals all day and throw blood everywhere. <laughs> that, that's not the point. Do you know what it actually is about? God wants to be in fellowship with us. You see, in the garden, we were, and he walked with them. He talked with them. But then when we sinned, he is a holy God. He has to stay away from that. But because he longs to be in fellowship with us, he decided to stay here and, and be in our presence through the tabernacle, through the Ark of the Covenant. And the way that we get to fellowship with him is to make sure there's a covering for our sins, an atonement for our sins, blood of an animal, a lifeblood that cleanses us from sin. That's, that's the way God set it up. But so did other nations. They practiced the same thing. But he said, bring these animals, bring these sacrifices, and then we can have fellowship because he wanted to have fellowship with you. God doesn't like space between us. He likes grace between us. He likes to be in fellowship with us. So we would be doomed if we didn't have fellowship with God, just so you know. We would be killing each other off, which is what they were doing in the Old Testament. It wasn't because God put space between us, it's because we put space between God. So he was trying to restore it. And he said, here's how we're gonna restore it. You're gonna bring atonement offering so that we can be in fellowship. Now here's the thing, we tried. We tried to obey the law, it didn't work. We kept sinning, so here we come again with another lamb in tow, ready to slaughter it. And then that lamb only appeased God for such a time. When we messed up again, we had to bring another one. Do you see the dilemma here? It's just constant because our human nature, the, 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 the law, the Bible says in Romans, the law could not fix us basically. It could not make us obey perfectly. We were desperate. We could never reconcile the brokenness. And let me, let me just make sure we understand what side we're on. We're the ones that offended God. We're the ones that sinned against God. God doesn't sin and he didn't sin against us. We're the one that's supposed to bring the offering. The problem is it wasn't working. It was never satisfying our debt. Do you know where I'm going? Yes, sir. The offended party, God, in his grace and mercy, brings an offering for us instead. Yes. Wow. Wow, he saw that we were unable to fulfill the requirements of the law, 
that we were not sinless, we were not perfect, so he gave up his sinless, perfect lamb to be the perfect offering so that we could have atonement and be in reconciliation and in peace, fellowship with God once more. That is what was accomplished on the cross for you, my friends, and for me, and for the whole world if they would receive. That is amazing grace. Now, this is why, now, this is why God has the right to say, confess your sins. He has the right to say, repent, turn away, because I gave up my precious son, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, so that you wouldn't return to that. Repent and turn to me. Turn away from that sin. That's why God has the right to say that. He, he always had the right anyway. But to give up, and I want us to take this, you know, personally, to give up his son like that, I don't know if we realize what he gave up for us. I don't know if we realize all the time what Jesus did for us. We we were the ones that should have been on the cross. We were the ones that were supposed to bring the reconciliation offering for atonement. And instead, God did it for us through Jesus Christ. We shouldn't trample on that grace, we should change. He has the right to call us out and say change, repent, don't turn back to that. I, I, I gave my son for you so that you would be changed. Really receive this because I wanna be in fellowship with you. Don't turn back to that old way of life. He has the right to do that. But you know what's crazy is he gives us the free will to deny it. I'm gonna to jump to something that is not on the screen, so hang with me. 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Let me explain that. To believers and even unbelievers whose hearts are still open to the message of Christ on the cross. It is good news, it is powerful, it is beautiful. But to those who have denied or turned from God, his word, and follow their own reasoning, it is foolishness. They're like, that's not gonna do anything for me. This is why some can hear the gospel of Christ, the message of the cross, and be transformed and changed. Meanwhile, many won't when they hear it. And this breaks my heart, my friends. That's why this Easter and for this play, I've been praying that people's hearts will be softened to believe in the message of the cross, that someone who did nothing was willing to die for you. That does seem foolish to the Romans and the Greeks and the Jews, but to all those who would believe, it is the power that saves us, the love on the cross for us. Romans 5, 1 says, therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. I wanna ask you a question to think about. What does peace with God feel like? Do you live at peace and in peace? Now we're gonna have troubles because Jesus warned us of that. And he said, take heart because I have overcome the world. In other words, trust in him, take courage in him because I'll get you through those troubles. But do you know that as Christians, we can have peace with God and feel at peace with him and still go through trials and troubles? You hear me preach on that. But let me tell you what I think it feels like to have peace with God. I'm not paranoid that God is getting ready to strike me. I'm not paranoid that God's keeping a record of wrongs up in heaven every time I've done something wrong. I'm not tired of trying to do every, I'm, I'm, I'm not tired of trying to work for God's love and approval. He already showed it to me on the cross. There are people in religions who are working so hard, they're exhausted and they're trying to feel at peace with God by doing all the things right when Jesus already did the work for us on the cross. And let me not jump ahead though, but I, I, don't, I, I don't have to, be afraid of God because he loves me. I'm at peace that he's forgiven me 
So because of that, now I actually have freedom to go do what he's saved me for. You know, I believe that you can get to a place in your life where you're not wrestling with trying to get God's approval anymore because you realize Jesus got that for us on the cross. And then you don't have to do a bunch of good things to outweigh all the bad things because that's salvation through works, not salvation by faith. And there are people who literally go, I gotta do more good things than I do bad things today and then God loves me. That's not the case. God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. So here's, here's what happens. When we believe in what Jesus has accomplished for us on the cross, if we trust that he did the works for us, we receive, we believe, we receive the righteousness that we need to be accepted by God and loved by him. That's really what Paul is trying to say, the gospels are trying to teach us, the letters in the New Testament are trying to teach us. So let me get to my last point. And by the way, when Jesus said, uh, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest, I know some of us are just physically tired. I get that. <laughs> That's not actually what Jesus was referring to. He was referring to those who are working for God's approval all the time, doing, trying to do everything perfect. And that's exhausting, isn't it? And then you're not at peace because you're thinking, oh man, I did one bad thing. Does God still forgive me? Let me do a bunch of things to cleanse myself. And then you're not sure if he does forgive you. That's not peace, my friends. What's peace is what Jesus did, it is finished. What Jesus has accomplished, it has been accomplished. That is peace. That is joy. That is assurance. That's blessed assurance. So my last point, accomplished by Christ, okay, received by faith. So here's the thing. When he said it is finished, that was actually an active verb, ongoing verb. So in other words, he wasn't saying that, okay, whoever I'm gonna make sure I explain this real quick because sometimes we can mess this up. Whoever was alive then, they're forgiven. No, the cross is still saving. The cross is still reaching, the cross of Christ, Jesus. His blood is still saving. He, he did what he had to do, but now the grace of God is working, saving people still. Until the day Jesus comes back, the grace, is, that's why it's called the day of grace or the season of grace in the Bible. It's time right now to receive by faith what Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, God saved you by his grace when? When you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done so that none of us can boast about it. By faith, through faith, when you believe, these are words in the New Testament. How about Romans 3, 23? For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty of our sins, for our sins, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life, shedding his blood. What's the point I'm trying to make? Grace is always available, but it must be received. The cross is still reaching and saving, but it must be believed. It must be received by faith. It must be applied. Grace is amazing, but unless it's applied, it's not doing anything, is it? Because people hear the message of grace, but it doesn't necessarily mean they actually apply it to their life. It doesn't necessarily mean that they actually believe it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they actually receive it and then do something with it. And it's right in that intersection where the grace of Christ is on the cross and then now it's a choice on our part to believe that the devil comes in and goes, you're not worthy of the cross and what it accomplished for you. It's right there 
where the devil likes to stop you and go, well, they didn't really, it wasn't enough. What Jesus did for you wasn't enough. You're such a terrible sinner. There's no way that that was enough. This is what the devil whispered to people. I've heard it. I've talked to people about this. And then even as Christians, we can question that the blood of Christ has accomplished what it said and what Jesus said would accomplish. We can begin to question that. Now, here's the thing. I have found that when Christians do struggle to believe, they sometimes are living in unrepentant, unforgiven sin, right? Or sins that they're just constantly going in. Unconfessed sin is what I mean, unrepentant sin. And that they need to confess their sins to God, ask him to cleanse them from this unrighteousness, and they will be. And they will have peace with God again. But we, there, this is why people can hear the message of the cross and still not believe. They must, or still not be changed, sorry. They can hear the message, you can come to church, you can hear the scriptures, you can watch Chosen Online, you can watch Passion of the Christ, you can hear the gospel preached, but unless you believe what Jesus has done for you, it won't change you. And church, that's why we need to pray every day for the lost that God would soften their hearts, that the Holy Spirit would convict them to believe in what Jesus has done for them. Can I get an amen for that? Because that is so important, so important. <clears throat> so important. You know, we're, we're, not, we're not in a battle against flesh and blood, are we? I was pretty bold last week, wasn't I? That's because there are spiritual powers coming against the church telling us to bow to it and agree with it. Because if we do, then who's gonna reach those people who are caught in it? Who are caught in sinful lifestyles, confusion, all those things, the lies. So when I say that we're not gonna bow to sinful things, I'm talking about the spiritual powers are coming against the church and you and I. I'm not giving in to lies. I'm gonna stand on the truth that God can save anyone. Amen. The grace is powerful enough for the worst sinner you know, which by the way, we all have sinned, so I don't know why we're grading each other. One sin is enough to be bad. Sure, sin does have Certain sins have greater effect on people than others. Okay, I get that. And that is very true. Especially sins that sin against other people and not just private sins against God. Sin hurts people. So there are severity to sin affects the, the consequences of those sins. But every single one of us that have sinned, we're guilty and we need the grace of God to forgive us. We need the cross. And I believe that anyone can be saved. I don't agree with limited atonement. I agree that the power of the cross of Christ and the blood of Jesus Christ is not limited. If anyone would believe, they could, be rece they could receive that salvation and be saved. Because that's limiting God and his power. And God is limitless in his power. So today, if you have felt so much shame, so much guilt about your past, and I'm talking to those of you who may have never heard this gospel message of what Jesus Christ has accomplished for you on the cross, I want you to know that you're never too far gone for his love. Amen. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. It can break through cold hearts, hard hearts, proud hearts. I will say we gotta humble ourselves though. We do. I remember reading in Hebrews where it says, if you hear the voice of God, if you hear him calling out to you, don't resist him, welcome it. I'm kind of giving the Ryan paraphrased version of that. It's in Hebrews three. But when you hear the voice of God calling on you, whispering to your heart, come to me, come to me, don't deny it, don't resist it. Today, don't do that. We're praying for the people who come to our play today, they don't do that either. We're gonna take communion together, but if you today here need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we wanna pray with you.
You know, when God gave us Jesus, if you need a, a communion cup, we have some being passed around. Just raise a hand real quick. We'll help you out. When God offered Jesus, you need one? We need one right down here, brother. Right down here, a couple. When he offered Jesus, that was an offering that we must accept if we want to experience the grace that comes with it. Do you guys follow me on that? Do not let anything stop you. If today is the day, it's the day. Here's another one. Here's a sneaky thing from the enemy too. The devil, the enemy. He'll say, oh, man, you're not gonna be able to live. You're not gonna be able to live that new life for God. It's not gonna be the same. You're not gonna like it. Come on now. Let's be real about our own journey. Oh, you won't you won't be satisfied with that life. With the one you got, that's the right one. That is demonic. Jesus will change your life and you won't want to turn back, my friends. What you experience in the presence of God is beautiful. It's amazing. Trust me, there's no better life than the life that Jesus has for you. Don't listen to that lie. Come on now, think about it. The life you're living now is destruction. Don't listen to that lie. What he has for you is so much better. Well, I don't know if I'll be able to give up all these things. He shows you how to give up things. And when you get Christ, you have everything that you'll ever need. He gives you a new joy, a new passion, a new heart for things that you never thought you would have, new desires, a hunger for his word, a love that you could never experience or, or imagine without him. I'm calling you home today, church. God is calling you home today. I'm his ambassador speaking on his behalf. Come home to God. He has made the way. So if that's you, let's all, let's all bow our heads, close our eyes. And for us Christians, let's prepare our hearts for communion. If there's anything that needs to be confessed in your life, we need to remember that we're in fellowship with Jesus Christ. Let us confess our sins. Let us, once again, express our love for him. But if you're in here today, you've never believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you hold a hand up nice and high? Just say, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. I want to do it right now. Beautiful. I see a young hand up. Anyone else? I give my life to Jesus today. I believe in what he's offered me. Amen. We're going to pray. Repeat after me. Dear Lord, thank you for the cross. Thank you for dying for my sins. Thank you for your forgiveness. I believe what you've accomplished for me. I receive the forgiveness for my sins. I trust in what Jesus has accomplished. I'm finished with my old life. Show me how to live this new life. I will follow you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that today, we want to be in touch with you. So there's blue cards in the pews. You can let us know. We'd love to help you with resources. Let's give God some praise for the salvations that were won today. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, God.